Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 1 in GIT 437 and 573. Hope things are getting off to a good start for you. We're going to cover this in three chunks. Well, maybe just two chunks. We'll see how it goes. Part 1 um, is... Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 1 in GIT 437 and 573. We're going to break these lectures each week into a few chunks, uh, part one and part two specifically for lecture one. Reason being that there's a lot of material to cover in each of these lectures and to keep it from being a little too long and, uh, you know, your eyes glossing over too soon, we're going to just break it into bits. So here's the topics for today. We're going to define capture. Well, we're not going to actually capture color. We're going to talk about capturing color, displaying color and printing color, kind of the foundation for the class here. Um, we're going to get a lot deeper into each of these topics as we go. Today's just kind of a high level overview of some of the ideas that we're going to cover. So let's jump in. We've got color reproduction as a topic. Uh, basically what we're talking about here is just how do we duplicate colors? How do we communicate colors? How do we reproduce them in different media? So uh, there's some examples in the bullet points here of different, different places that you see color being reproduced. But the whole gist of what we're doing here in this class and in JIT and the graphics industry as a whole is reproducing color information. If, if there were no color information, you know, we'd be taking a giant step back in the information that we're communicating and, and the, the graphics we can display and so on and so forth. So the whole point of this, I mean, there's a lot of points to it, but the whole point of this is really comes down to kind of consistency. I would say if you can achieve consistent color, in what you're communicating in terms of color, what you're printing, what you're photographing, what you're displaying or projecting, that's all gonna uh, translate to achieving the goals of color management. So color management really is, is there so that you can achieve consistent color across the board, which translates into savings of cost and time, ability to, to accurately communicate colors, matching color across different media, statistical analysis of color, reproduction, which in turn leads to flexibility and cost saving and time. And it's all kind of this circle. So we'll, we'll get into this more as we go along. But one thing that also we should be aware of is that uh, having an, an effective color management system helps solve for inexperience, meaning instead of an expert that can eyeball a print or a proof on a screen or any of the color, color situations, the label, you can have a novice um, or someone like me who can't tell colors apart to save their life, take a device and just hold that device up and measure that color and tell you whether it's pass or fail. It's instrument based. It's scientific measurement, which uh, takes a lot of the guesswork out of that. And you don't need somebody that's an artist in terms of color to be able to analyze whether color is accurate or correct or not. Lots of different ways to capture color. Um, big ones that we're going to think about here in our terms, and this goes to digital or film, is photography, scanning, and video. So photography, you're all familiar with. You all have an iPhone or some kind of phone that takes pictures, and those are color pictures. Um, you may not have thought about how that color is captured by the camera, but it's something we're going to think about in this class. Um, if you're in GIT 384 or have taken that in the past, or maybe even my 334 or other classes, we talk about this in there too. How is color reproduced in a digital environment? Scanners are simply, they're kind of like a camera, basically a digital camera, but it runs on a, you know, a flatbed instead of a, a sensor. And video a lot of times works the exact same way as a camera, whether it's digital or film. A film camera is going to be recording uh, individual photos and playing them back at a, at a certain speed. Uh, stills cameras just can be taking a single frame of film or a digital video camera is going to be doing the same thing as a digital uh, stills camera. So um, let's talk a little bit more about photography and we're going to get historical here for a second. So looking back, one of the first people to take a still color photo is James Clerk Maxwell and his assistant Thomas Sutton. So they didn't really take a single photo. They took three photos they took a photo of a still scene three times. It's a rib, and I'll show you a picture of it here in just a second. They took a photo the first time with a red filter, the second photo with a green filter, and the third photo with a blue filter. And luckily, this thing wasn't moving at all. Then once those were developed, they're still just black and white frames, black and white photos, three of those. 
Once those are developed, they're still black and white, just a negative. Those are projected through green, red, and blue filters onto a white screen. So what you get is something that looks kind of like this. These are the actual three photos. In the background, you see those three photos projected. Um, that's the, the labeled red, green, and blue slides that you see in the background. Right in front of those are just color filters. So the number two, four, and I can't see the number over there on the blue one, but you see red, green, and blue filters in front of those. And then the composite, the image that's projected is what you see on the far right there. And that's the composite of the red, green, and blue projected light. That's kind of the basis for a, a lot of how color works in our digital systems and film cameras and, and throughout all over the place. We have a channel, red, green, and blue. In Photoshop, if you look at your channels on an RB, RGB image, you see something very similar to this. And when you stack those up together, we get a color image. We take this a step further and we're just talking historically here again. Many of you have heard of the term Technicolor. If you if you watch an old movie ever, you'll see Color by Technicolor. It was a company um, that actually still exists today. They do different things now. But a Technicolor system, there were several, process one, two, three, and four, and, and on. But these are different systems. This diagram that's on the right hand side is an original diagram showing how that worked. And if my mouse shows up on the recording, hopefully this will work. Light enters your lens right here, hits a prism. This prism is going to split that light coming in through the lens into two images, two mirror images. One's going to go to the left, one's going to go to the right, and one on the right is going to go through a green filter. The green filter, the purpose of that is it blocks everything except for the green light. So this sheet of film, the strip of film, is going to be exposed with light coming through that green filter. It's still just a black and white strip of film but it's going to give you just the green light that came through. On the left hand side, you have a magenta filter and magenta we know is made of blue and red. So blue and red light are making it through there. And there's actually two strips of film layered on top of one another on the left hand side over here. One is sensitive to blue and the red light can actually pass through that blue film and hit the red film behind it. And I say red and blue film, they're still just black and white film. They're just each being exposed with different colors of light. Kind of like what you see here in the background. Each of those images is still just a black and white image, but when it gets projected a certain way, then it can display the full color. Anyway, so with those black and white strips of film, we've got color information for red, green, and blue. Um, depending on the process for Technicolor, they would layer those three strips together and each of them would have been printed at that point. They developed and dyed with a color. And so the end is you get a composite that you can show through or certain projection systems would uh, play those each separately side by side and project those through different lenses with different colored filters over them. It's a whole complex thing. Anyway, <laughs> don't worry too much about it. We're obviously not doing Technicolor film projection or anything like that, but it, it's of interest because it helps you to get a, a feel for how color worked historically because color works the same now. Our, our methods for capturing it are just a little bit more advanced than they used to be and displaying it, reproducing it. Anyway, moving on. Monitors, screens, different types of things that display color have progressed throughout time as well. So going back to the, the older days, uh, many of you probably don't remember using a, uh, a big, heavy, bulky square TV. Uh, when I grew up, that was all there was, um, you know, many of you are probably younger than some of you might remember those or have seen them in pictures or videos, but those big cathode ray tube TVs were early displays. And I, again, I, it's historical, it's, it's relevant. And I encourage you to research it and look it up. There's some really fun, interesting videos on YouTube that you can learn about early cathode ray TVs and display technology. But the basic idea is still the same. We're projecting an image onto a screen with those TVs. And the screen in this case was, is the front of the TV. Modern monitors like LCD or LED monitors or TVs, they work a little bit differently. And there's not a projector in that case, but the light is being emitted towards the viewer in either case. That's the main thing to remember is that light is being emitted by those displays. And we call that additive color. And what you see on the right hand side over here at the bottom, is if you were to zoom in really, really close on any kind of display like that or a screen, you're going to see 
a bunch of pixels and they don't look like this. This is a simplification, but if all the red pixels are on, then that's going to look red, obviously, right? If the green and the red pixels are on, what do we get with green and red together? We get yellow, right? So this would actually look yellow to us because those pixels are very small and closely packed together. And you can try this sometime. If you ever get a chance to pull out a magnifying glass and just take a look at your phone screen or your monitor or your TV, you'll see this. It's pretty interesting and fun. Or like I said before, there's plenty of videos. On the right hand side, you see this one. We've got red, green, and blue pixels all active. And what do we get with red, green, and blue is, is white. So additive color is when we're adding colors together, we end up getting white. So anything that's emitting light is an additive color system. So whether that's a, a jumbotron at a, at a sports event or the billboard on the side of the road, electronic billboard, or your computer monitor or your phone, all of those are additive color systems. So they use red, green, and blue because when we add those colors together, we can get white. More to come on this. We'll talk about this a lot more with color modes, color spaces, and so on. Printed color works a little bit differently. This, I'm going to jump to the bottom. This is subtractive color. And hopefully the, the diagram on the right illustrates how that works with subtractive color. I put black down here just because a white sheet of paper doesn't show up on a white background in my slide. But imagine this is a white piece of paper on the base. That's our substrate. We have a light source in this case. Um, let's just say white light, like sunlight. And we know, or we will learn shortly if you don't already know, but white light is comprised of all the different wavelengths of light. All the different colors are comprised in that. You can look at a Pink Floyd t-shirt with a prism on it to get the idea. We'll talk about this more, but we've got white light shining and, and a white sheet of paper is going to reflect all those different wavelengths of light equally. And so the combination of red, green, blue, and everything else is going to lead to us seeing white on that paper. That's why it looks white. It's equally re reflecting all of the light. If we put down some layers of other pigments like uh, magenta and cyan and or whatever, anyway, these colors don't match up. Don't look too closely at that. But different pigments are going to absorb different wavelengths of light and reflect some. So if we want to get cyan, we put down cyan ink on the paper, but what's really happening is that cyan ink, it's absorbing all the other wavelengths of light and all that's being reflected is a cyan. If we put down other colors of ink, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, all the different colors of ink on the paper, what's happening is they're absorbing all those different wavelengths of light, whether equally or inequally, and whatever it is, the more of that pigment we put on the paper or substrate, the less light being reflected. And so when we talk about subtractive color, typically we're talking about CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, because as we subtract out more and more color, more light from our light source, then we end up getting black, which kind of makes sense, right? Now it says kind of in parentheses, we'll get to this later on, but just remember, you don't actually get black. Think back to finger painting in kindergarten. If you mix together all those different paints, you don't really get true black. You get kind of a dark, muddy color. Lastly, here we're going to talk about the term color metrology. Uh, it's a simple definition. Uh, metrology is the science of measurement, basically. So uh, this is the science of measuring color. Uh, the different wavelengths of light, which we're going to get to, we're going to talk about wavelengths and electromagnetic radiation and lots of other sciencey stuff that's really interesting. Uh, but, but simply put, measuring that is a very precise science. Um, we have instruments available to us that we can measure that very, very exactly. And so because we can do that, we can achieve consistency. We can embed that information and that science into electronic systems and mechanical systems and, and otherwise. So color metrology, color reproduction, they're all kind of part of a whole, which we call color management. Color management is our philosophy, our way of working uh, with design systems, with color reproduction systems like display and print and otherwise that allows us to be consistent and to be repeatable and to be able to communicate clearly about color information and uh, have a system that just works. Um, so that's our goal, color management.